Please be seated as I pray. Father God, thank you for this sweet time of worship, Lord. Thank you for giving us an opportunity to come together as a church and worship you in song. Lord, help this next portion of our service to be pleasing to you, Lord, in your name, amen. Hi, thank you for being here today. Um, we have men in the front with Bibles. Um, they're ready to hand them out to you guys. If you don't have one, um, please raise your hand, and they'd love to put one in your hands. Um, and if you need to keep it, that's our gift to you. Uh, we'll be looking at 1 John chapter 1. Um, so you can go ahead and turn there, and we'll be there in a minute. Um, before we get there, um, I want to talk about this part of the service, the time where we take the Lord's Supper. Several of the Gospels give an account of the Last Supper of Jesus. And in this, he instituted the practice of taking bread to represent his body with, that would be broken for us and a glass of wine that would be spilt for us at the cross. Later in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul gives instruction on how the Lord's Supper should be practiced in the church. The way we, the elders of GBC, have decided to apply these sections of scripture is with the part of the weekly service that we're in right now. We desire to spend some time meditating on God's word around the truths of the gospel followed by a time of personal examination as we pass out a piece of cracker and a small cup of juice. Then this morning I will ask you to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made when he went to the cross and made forgiveness possible. As those of you that put your faith in Christ think on these things, I will ask you to remember Jesus' death, and I will ask you to take communion on your own, and then I'll finish our time in prayer. So let's begin with God's word this morning. We will focus primarily on that time of personal examination. A few weeks ago, I talked about this God's standard of holiness. We saw that scripture teaches us from 1 Peter 1 to be holy as God is holy. We learned that our standard for holiness is God. And this has been a helpful truth for me to be meditating on these last few weeks. However, Romans 3.23 tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So what do we do when our time of personal examination convicts us that we are nowhere near the standard? The answer to that question, I believe, comes in 1 John 1, 8, and 9. So turn with me to your Bibles, and I'll read it. It says, if we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This passage describes two very, position, very different positions we can have towards our sin. And this morning, I want to examine them closer. So the position from verse 8 um, talks about one who does not recognize their sin for what it is. It describes this person as one who says that he has no sin. Scripture tells us that this person is characterized by two things. He is deceiving himself. He is denying a truth that is written on everyone's heart. I think this is a very consistent position in today's society. It's the all men are basically good view. I hear it all the time. Oh, I'm fine. I'm plenty good enough. I have a right view of morality, and I meet that view. This view tells us that this person is in blatant self-deceit. The other characterization is in the second half of the verse. Let's look at that together. It says, the truth is not in us. Meaning, if we say we have no sin, the truth is not in that person. This person clearly understands, or lacks an understanding of biblical truth. There's a clear distinction in scripture of one who knows biblical truth and one who has a clear, life-changing understanding of that truth. No matter where you open your Bible, it doesn't take very many pages for God's word to define man as a sinner. It's not hard to see that we have a sin nature, but this verse is describing one that doesn't just know in their head this truth, but describes one who has this truth in them. I wanna talk about this person a little bit more in a minute, but let's look at the other position towards our sin. Let's look at verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The other position we can have towards our sin is one of confession of sin. What does confession look like? I'll give you a few characterizations of biblical confession. 
Biblical confession requires a humble recognition of our own sinfulness. One needs to fully understand what God thinks of our sin. J.C. Ryle describes it this way. Sin is essentially our futile attempt to dethrone God from being our highest pursuit, love, joy, and delight. Sin is substituting primarily ourselves in God's place as our highest pursuit, love, joy, and delight. We need to have a humble recognition of our sinfulness so we can reposition our pursuit, our love, our joy, and our delight to where they need to be on God. Another characterization of biblical confession requires godly sorrow. This godly sorrow recognizes the destructiveness of our sin, both in our position towards a holy God and in the hurt that has, it has inflicted in our wake. J.C. Ryle goes on to say, it's not enough to simply understand factually what sin is. True repentance involves brokenness over sin, genuine sadness that God was not your highest pursuit, love, joy, and delight. He was robbed of the glory and praise that was due to him. Listen to this part. It says, being sorry for the consequences that have come from sin is not necessarily genuine repentance. Genuine repentance makes you very sad that God was not seen to be great and that the great good that he truly is. The third characterization of biblical confession of sin requires specific verbalization of specific sin, specific confession. We can't confess sin in generalities. Confession of sin is not a statement like, I was prideful last week. It instead says something like this. When my wife brought up an interaction that I had with our kids as being harsh, I dismissed it outright and told her she was wrong. I was unteachable, proud in my attitude, and unloving in my response. Upon further examination, she hit the nail on the head, and I was positioning myself towards my kids in anger. See how clarity and confession makes the path to repentance so much more clear? There's not a lot I can know what to do when I say I need to be less prideful. But looking at the second example, it is clear how I can seek to be more teachable, more humble when exhorted, more loving in response to exhortation, and to change my position towards my kids away from anger and towards patient shepherding. Biblical confession of sin requires specific confession of specific sin. Before I move on, I want to make sure something isn't misunderstood. I'm speaking here specifically about confession of sin. Confession is a very important step within the process of repentance, but it is not the entire process. If you have more questions about the process of repentance, I'd love to talk to you about it later. Just look for me or any one of the elders after the service and we can talk about it. This verse gives us something to do when we recognize our sins. We must confess our sin well. It also gives us two promises of what God will do for one that has this position towards sin. It says that he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God is faithful and righteous. That is a staggering statement in and of itself. It's a true description of God, and we should stand in awe of that statement on its own. But what blows my mind this morning is the object of that faithfulness and righteousness. The passage says that he is faithful and righteous to forgive our sins and cleanse our unrighteousness. What a sweet, gracious God we have. Looking closer at the forgiveness and cleansing, I want to read from D. Edmund Hebert's commentary. He puts the forgiveness of sin like this. The words to forgive us our sins indicate God's response to the guilt of our sins. As a failure to conform to God's laws, our sin makes us guilty and subject to punishment. But when we confess them to him, he acts to forgive as a definite act to remove, more literally, to send away. Those sins, so that they no longer stand between us and God, they are sent away as a cloud is dissolved, never to appear again. Such a sweet picture. And he goes on to talk about the cleansing of unrighteousness. Upon our confession, God specifically acts to cleanse us from the pollution of our sins. Sin produces a defilement which only God can remove. This total cleansing restores us to fellowship with God. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, is the cleansing agent, not our confession. But the confession of our sin makes possible the application of this divine cleansing. Today, when we receive the bread and the juice, I want you to think of ways in which you have sinned this week. Take this time to biblically confess these sins. Remember that if we confess those sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of them. If you are here this morning, 
but you were one that doesn't put your faith in Jesus to save you from your sins, maybe by your own examination, you are in the verse 8 position. I want to speak to you for a minute. I want you to think about the same section in a very real way. You can easily have a right understanding of your own sins. Your standard for yourself is not God's standard. No matter what you think is good enough, you have fallen short of the holiness of God. But Jesus came to this earth to save sinners. This act of love and mercy is put on full display when we confess our sins and see his position towards us change through Christ's death on the cross. I want to beg you this morning to recognize your sin. Recognize how God sees your sin and seek his forgiveness. He went to the cross to bear the punishment for your sins. He asks you to believe in him for eternal life. You can do that right now. However, if you do not do that, please let the cup and bread pass. This time of communion is a time of worship reserved for those who put their trust in Jesus. If you have questions, please see me or any one of the elders or the person that brought you here. We'd love to talk to you about our Savior. Men, can you please serve us? And as they do, take communion on your own, and I'll come back and pray.